I'm Nick Gibson, a local government reporter for the Spokesman Review, and I'm joined today by my colleague Ellen Dennis, our Olympia and State Legislature reporter. We're here today to speak with Washington Attorney General Bob Ferguson, a Democratic candidate for governor. Bob, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for being here today. To start, we wanted to kind of give you the opportunity to make your pitch. Um, why should voters cast their vote for you in the August 6th primary? Well, I think if somebody wants a governor who's not a status quo kind of politician, who's whether ready to lean into the changes we need to make as a state to address the challenges we have, but at the same time, protecting the freedoms and the rights that we have, I think I'm the right fit and have the right experience to do that. And in terms of Spokane specifically, hey, I'm a candidate that's actually lived in Spokane. I've worked in Spokane, and I launched my campaign for governor in Spokane. So I'll be a governor for the people of Washington State in all 39 counties. I've lived and worked on both sides of the mountains, and that's an important perspective to bring to this race as well. Well, thank you. Um, Ellen, do you want to take the next question? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, thanks so much for being here today, Bob. Um, I'm curious if the Climate Commitment Act is repealed through the initiative on the November ballot and you're elected to be Washington's governor, how would you address that in office? Well, look, we'll have to cross that bridge and get to it. First of all, you know, I oppose the repeal of the Climate Commitment Act, which of course brings in hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in good union jobs all across our state. It's good for jobs, it's good for our economy, it's good to ensure we have clean air and clean water. It's worth pointing out there's a contrast in this race. My opponent, Dave Reichert, denies that humans contribute to climate change. Uh, and I don't think at this critical time uh, in our state's history, we can afford to have a governor who denies the science around climate. So there's a stark contrast here, but the budget impacts would be significant. Um, and we'll cross that bridge if we get to it. Uh, but right now, it's my hope that Washingtonians uphold the act. Look, I think it needs to be tweaked. There need to be some changes, um, but uh, we should not throw out the entire Climate Commitment Act. In the event um, voters do uh, repeal that and approve the initiative, um, I guess what is your next steps as a governor that you know is thinking about the climate? Well, look, I mean, it's, it's a hypothetical, right? Uh, right now, it is the law. Um, obviously, there's a whole campaign around that. You know, we have plenty of our on our plate right now with the issues the state is facing. Um, look, if the voters choose to repeal the Climate Commitment Act, look, as a governor, I'd have to deal with that in that moment. Um, but right now, where we're facing sort of actual issues that are really before us right now um, on a whole range of critical issues. So that's my focus right now. Well, one of the other issues that's kind of front of mind in eastern Washington um, is natural gas and the future of it in the state. What are your thoughts on the state's efforts to de-emphasize natural gas and the initiative that will appear on the ballot this November? Yeah, I haven't taken a look. I think the initiative just qualified, I think, uh, for the ballot, my understanding. Honestly, I've not even taken a look at that yet, so we'll need to do that. Uh, on the other three initiatives, you know, which have been on the ballot now for some time, I've staked out a clear position of being opposed to those uh, to those three initiatives. And so, look, we have to look as a state moving forward to all these questions about making sure we're addressing clean air, clean water. The state's moving in a certain direction. And again, we can't have a governor who denies the science around climate change. But on that initiative specifically, we'll take a look at it. I just haven't had a chance to deal with that yet. Thank you. Ellen, do you want to take the next one? Yeah. Kind of stemming off of that, um, with discussions about natural gas and moving toward clean energy as a state, um, there have been talks of building wind farms. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the Horse Heaven Hills Wind Farm Project. And if you're elected as governor, how would you approach um, building wind farms or solar farms and addressing a lot of different um, communities um, and environmental interests that would be impacted by that? Well, there's a balance. You also have interests from tribes, for example, have strong views about some of these projects. So there's a lot of competing stakeholders, a lot of competing perspectives on these projects. But I'd say the high level is Look, the state's moving in one direction. There's a transition to a green economy that's coming. You can either elect a governor who believes that humans contribute to climate change, okay, and embraces that change, which is supported by, for example, our friends in the labor community, in the building trades, who have all endorsed my campaign. Uh, why? Because I support good union, good paying jobs. Uh, that'll be a big part of that transition. Or you can elect a 
Dave Reichert, a governor who literally denies the science around climate change. And so, look, on specific issues, I won't get into those, right? Those get litigated. There's a process for determining those, which stakeholders have a process. And the governor sometimes has a role there. So I'm not going to prejudge any of those. Um, but it's important to make sure we're listening to all stakeholders and trying to find the right balance as we go forward that takes into account all sides, be thoughtful about it. And as a governor, that's the approach that I would take. Another topic that's been top of mind during this gubernatorial election is that of policing in the state. Um, if you're elected as governor um, with the police pursuit initiative passing to kind of roll back restrictions on police pursuit, what would your approach be as a whole to policing in the state, um, be that staffing numbers and also balancing um, police accountability? Sure. So look, I think it's sort of a false choice. You can't have one without the other, right? Uh, obviously, most law enforcement officers serve with great distinction to keep our community safe. If someone doesn't do that, there needs to be accountability for that. Um, but I'm proud of my records as an attorney general. We have a small criminal division where if a local prosecutor, for example, Spokane County, if they can't bring a case, they can ask my team to prosecute a case. Those can be murders, murders, for example, or other serious felonies. My team does that. We take cases from prosecutors all across Washington state. So I'm a believer in enforcing our criminal laws. We do that as an office. We handle cases for uh, sexually violent predators in 38 out of 39 counties. 38 counties ask me and my team to handle those cases for them to make sure the most dangerous offenders that we have in the state go to McNeil Island and are not released into our communities all across the state. We're proud of our work and making sure we're upholding the safety of all Washingtonians. And so that's critical to my work as Attorney General That'll be critical to my work as governor as well. I think you asked about staffing issues. First plan I rolled out, and I encourage folks who are listening to this conversation to go to my webpage, bobferguson.com. When the Seattle Times endorsed me, they said we have the most detailed policy positions of anyone running for governor. On issue after issue, we put up detailed policy positions. The first one we put up was on public safety. One component of that is pointing out that we rank last as a state per capita in number of law enforcement officers we have. That's unacceptable. I'm proposing putting into our state budget $100 million, $100 million that local jurisdictions like Spokane County, for example, could draw upon for hiring bonuses or increased salaries so they can attract more law enforcement officers to their local jurisdictions. So this is important um, to make sure that we have a governor who is promoting public safety. Um, that's what I've done as attorney general and look forward to continuing that as governor. For that um, funding mechanism, just to follow up on that, would that extend to uh, public defenders and prosecutors as well and kind of other aspects law, of the system? This would be for law enforcement officers. I want to be clear, in my time as a county council member, I advocated for increased funding for public defenders. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, someone who's a lawyer, I value the both prosecutors and public defense. But where we rank 50th, where we rank last right now, is number of law enforcement officers we have. And that needs to change as a state. Thank you. Um, while we're talking about the criminal justice system, I wanted to ask uh, kind of about the politic politicization of the courts. Um, on the state and federal level, that's a topic of conversation. What do you think about the role of the court system in politics? Well, you look, as the attorney general, we're in our local, state, and federal courts literally every single day. Um, I'm thankful that I live in a country where we resolve our disputes with the process, the court system. Is it perfect? Of course not. Um, but we believe that that system works. Of course, it's become more politicized. We've seen with Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court appointments at the federal level. Um, that politicization worries me. Um, but it's worth pointing out hey, during the last Trump administration, um, you know, my office was active in challenging the Trump administration. We felt they violated the law. I think we had 58 cases that were resolved in the courts. We won 55 of them. Some of those in front of the United States Supreme Court, you know, which is has a conservative bent. Uh, so I felt during some pretty contentious high profile cases involving our past president that we always had a fair hearing in the courts. That's something that I believe in. And I think that's something that we uh, that we had. I might also point out, look, I've challenged Barack Obama in court and beat him. I've also taken on Joe Biden in court and beat him. Uh, so we're equal opportunity who we take on. But that doesn't mean we agree with every decision. Of course not. Um, 
But uh, but I find that in our office and with my excellent legal team that we feel we get fair hearings and uh, and thoughtful decisions from the judges who we interact with. Thank you. Um, in eastern and central Washington, as wildfire season burns hotter and longer, um, there have been some problems getting state and um, national resources to help with um, fire cleanup um, and disaster response. If you're elected, what would you do to work on that? Yeah, I think the state legislatures has made significant investments in the past couple of years into addressing wildfires, which I think is a good thing. Uh, there's been a significant investment there that will need to continue. We're experiencing that as we're literally having this conversation right now here in Washington State and across the Northwest. So, look, we need to be proactive and on the front foot and not reacting to firefighters. And so that will continue with budgets I have as a governor and working, of course, with the next commissioner of public lands, who plays a key role on issues related to firefighters as well. <clears throat> One other thing I just will mention, which I should have in your last question, by the way, is, you know, governor has a key role with the courts. When there are vacancies, the governor literally makes appointments to our local superior courts, for example, or court of appeals, or even state Supreme Court. Uh, governor Inslee has made, I suspect, hundreds of appointments over his 12 years as governor. And I think the people say Washington want a governor who will make thoughtful decisions. I think my background as attorney general um, gives me a good background for that. You know, in contrast, Dave Riker says he's voting for Donald Trump, says, and I'm quoting, I love Donald Trump's policies on policy were aligned. Look, I don't think the people of Washington State want someone who's aligned with Donald Trump on policy uh, to be making appointments to the bench here in Washington State. So that'd be a contrast as well. Alan, did you have any um, additional questions you wanted to ask uh, Bob while we have him here today? Yeah. Um... If you're elected, what is the biggest change you would make to the governor's office as it functions today? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite catch that. I'd make the biggest switch now? If you're elected, what is the biggest change you would make to the governor's office as it functions today? Biggest change, that's a great question. What I would say is, I'll try and give a relatively short answer to this. Um, and let me start by saying when I became attorney general 12 years ago, we have the largest law firm in the state. We've got nearly 800 attorneys, for example. We're a big, big operation. A big part of our work is we're the law firm for the state. We give legal advice to every state board, commission, agency. Very important work that we do. The other part of our work is, of course, being the law firm for the people. Consumer protection, civil rights, environmental enforcement, antitrust. You get the idea. On that latter part of the equation, frankly, we did a lousy job. Not because we didn't have good people doing work. We just didn't have people doing that work often at all. If you called our office with a civil rights complaint, we referred you somewhere else. If you called our office with an environmental complaint, we referred you somewhere else. We'd had one consumer protection trial in the 17 years before I was attorney general. The team was just too small to take on a powerful corporation that was violating the law. That made no sense to me. We completely changed um, that part of our office. Whereas now we have the best civil rights enforcement team in the country by any fair measure. Our consumer protection team has recovered literally billions of dollars for the people of the state of Washington, most recently more than a billion dollars by taking on some of the largest corporations in the world that fueled the opioid epidemic by violating the law, entities like Purdue Pharmaceutical. Our environmental enforcement team has secured dozens of criminal convictions and won hundreds of millions of dollars from penalties from polluters. My point being that we changed the culture of the AG's office, which was already a very high functioning agency, but honestly did not center the people in the work that we did in the way that I thought made sense. When I look at being governor, to your question, what I most want to change is to make sure that the bureaucracy, which exists too much in state government, all these agencies that have a huge impact on our lives, whether we realize it or not, is there too much bureaucracy? You bet. Is there too much industry capture? You bet. The culture of state government, the bureaucracy of state government needs a change in the same way the AG's office had to change, to center the people in the work that we do. Look, I'm proud that as a candidate, I'm the only candidate who does not accept money, no donations from large corporations or corporate PACs. We have received over 75,000 donations to my campaign, which dwarfs all other candidates combined. So look, if your listeners want a governor who's focused on them, who's focused on making sure that government works for the people, that eliminates the bureaucracy to address all the challenges we have as a state, that's what I've done as an attorney general to get results for the people of the state of Washington. And that's certainly what I'll do as the next governor. All right. Um, Ellen, uh, do you have any additional questions or? Um, 
do you have anything else that you wanted to ask about? I think just to wrap I, up. I, I, I would just add, we haven't talked about reproductive freedom, which, by yeah. the way, is a pretty critical issue for the people of the state of Washington and the post ops world. It's worth pointing out there is a very stark contrast in this race on that fundamental issue uh, for the women of Washington state. Specifically, Dave Reichert is anti-choice. He voted multiple times in Congress, voted multiple times for a nationwide abortion ban that criminalizes doctors. In other words, he would have made abortions that are legal in Washington state illegal with his votes and would have criminalized doctors who performed abortions. Uh, look, he, he was caught on tape speaking to a pro-life group saying that he would seek to unravel our state's reproductive laws. You don't take my word for it. The Seattle Times, when they endorsed me, highlighted what he said to that pro-life group and how that was contrary to public statements he made. Um, I just do not think at this time that Washingtonians want a governor who supports Donald Trump, says he loves Donald Trump's policies, says he's going to seek to unravel reproductive laws in Washington state, and voted three times for a nationwide abortion ban that would criminalize doctors here in Washington state. I'm proud to be pro-choice. I'm proud to stand up for reproductive freedom. And I think that's a contrast that um, you know, your listeners should know about. And we've talked about it. Um, you've spoken to kind of some of the differences between you and your opponents here. Are there any other uh, kind of key stand that are key items that make you stand out as a candidate compared to some of your opponents? Sure. Look, the only opponent that counts here is Dave Riker. That's going to be me against Dave Riker in the general election. Uh, the race is very clear where this race is going. And look, my differences with Dave Riker are numerous, uh, including what I've mentioned, but also when he was in Congress, look, he voted 37 times to repeal the Affordable Care Act. You know, I'm sorry, you know, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Washingtonians, they depend on the Affordable Care Act on Obamacare. If you're someone with a pre-existing condition, look, Dave Reichert voted multiple times to deny you health coverage for your pre-existing condition. I'm proud that as an attorney general, when there was a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, I stepped in, helped defend it all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. That is a fundamental difference between myself and Dave Reichert as well. On homelessness, you know, I could go on, but on homelessness, his proposal to address the unhoused in our state is to send them to McNeil Island. McNeil Island is where literally my team sends sexually violent predators. That's where they are. It's a small island. Dave Riker, he said this over and over and over to reporters that he seeks to send the unhoused, our homeless population, to McNeil Island. Uh, you know, I'm not sure where to start with such an unserious idea for such a serious issue. So on issue after issue, there's a stark contrast with me and Dave Riker. That is who I'll be running against um, in November. And he's got a consistent pattern of saying one thing to reporters like you and something else entirely behind closed doors. That was pointed out by the Seattle Times when they endorsed me. By the way, the Seattle Times endorsed Dino Rossi over Chris Gregoire, Rob McKenna over Jay Inslee, but endorsed me over Dave Reichert. And a key reason was because they said Dave Reichert over and over says one thing to the public and something else behind closed doors to his mega supporters. So there's a clear contrast there as well. Well, Bob, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the voters uh, ahead of the primary? Uh, no, looking back, looking forward to getting back to Spokane to watch Gonzaga play. Uh, I get back there with my son every year to watch them play, so we're big fans. And uh, love my time there. Had dinner at the Elk restaurant literally, I think, every night when I was clerking for a federal judge in Spokane. So love my time there and look forward to getting back. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, thanks thank so much for being here. Great. You bet. Have a great day, you guys. You too. You too. Bye.